Thank you for joining me. This is Katie Whitledge with the Beyond the Technique podcast. Hey, everybody. We're back again talking about surviving and thriving in our series, shining a light on the everyday owners and operators of these amazing salons throughout North America. And I am thrilled to have first-time guest Laura Moore here. We're talking survive and thrive with salon CFO and corporate controller, Laura Moore out of the Indianapolis and Carmel, Indiana location. And you may have heard of a large salon group there called MDG Salons. This is uh, where Laura is out of. And so I can't wait for you to meet her. But before I bring her to the mic, a couple things. First, if you love seeing the face behind the name, you got to go to Beyond the Techniques YouTube page, click the subscribe button. So A, you'll get notified every time we release something new. But also, then you can watch today's conversation. We have so many video podcasts on there. It's just really nice to see the person who we are connecting with here over the podcast. Um, And also, I want to give a shout out quick to our sponsor, Meet Your Stylist. Without our sponsors, we couldn't produce two episodes per week. So thank you, Meet Your Stylist. What is Meet Your Stylist? Well, if you have five or more stylists on your team, oftentimes it's a struggle to think about how to make sure you're getting enough clients in their chair to fill their chair? And most importantly, are we getting the right clients with the right stylist? It's a fact that if guests don't have a great first visit, there's a less than 10% chance that they'll come back to your salon brand again for fear of running into that stylist and having that awkward, painful interaction. They'd rather avoid it altogether. But we have a solution for you. If you go to meetyourstylist.com and join the movement, you will then have your own fun, easy, accurate matchmaking survey that lives on your salon website, converting website visitors into lifetime clients. This is all based on behavioral science. It goes above and beyond basic matching principles. This goes deeper into really like eHarmony, those personality profiles of love languages, lifestyle preferences, all the things that bring meaning to our relationships and why we do what we do behind the chair for all the years we do it. Go to meetyourstylist.com. Well, again, I'm so excited to have Laura Moore here because her and I have gotten to know each other behind the scenes for the last couple of years, and it's just been awesome because she is so sharp and so on top of things. Like she's my kind of woman and she's fierce and fabulous. Watch our show and you'll see. Let me just share that Laura is the CFO, as I mentioned, and corporate controller of the 36-year-old privately owned and multi-location MDG Salons, which is a family-owned and operated salon organization situated in Carmel and Indianapolis, Indiana. Multi-million dollars here, friends, with many, many employees and a whole new perspective. And while Laura hasn't spent decades in the industry, she brings a wealth of knowledge from her professional background, which includes banking, lending, HR consulting, and her former ownership of an independent insurance agency. So I believe that this perspective today will be so impactful, and I'm so excited to welcome Laura Moore. Welcome to be on the Technique Podcast. Katie, thank you. A pleasure to be here. Thanks so much for having me on today. Oh, the pleasure is mine, and I'm just excited for everybody to learn a bit about you and then a bit about your salon. Let's start with you. Um, You haven't been in the industry for decades, but tell us a bit about your background and what brought you into the beauty industry. Right. So I've been um, in the salon industry or the beauty industry, if you will, for three years, Uh, a very, very short, but impactful three years. Um, As you mentioned, I was formerly in insurance and um, left my independent insurance agency, went to spend some time in corporate America, and then my mother uh, fell ill. She was diagnosed um, in July of, no, sorry, July of 17 um, with stage four non-small cell lung cancer. So it was metastatic. It it was not a good... uh, good day when we got that information. But at the time I was in corporate America, um, working insurance, I was a marketing coordinator for a fortune 500 company. And I was dating Travis, my now husband at the time, um, who speaking of meet your stylist, um, being similar to like eHarmony and and match.com and things like that. I actually met Travis on (laughs) match.com. Yeah. Yeah. Funny. Um, but anyway, his, he and his family, um, they own, still MDG salons. And they were really at this point in the growth 
of their salon where they needed somebody to come in and kind of take control and also had them in a direction financially to allow them continued growth and that strong financial momentum. So, um, you know, he said, hey, you've got this experience and your various backgrounds, um, professionally speaking, this is what we need. We can offer you flexibility to be with your mother while she's going through chemo. Um, and, and it really, it all worked out uh, quite beautifully, to be honest. I ended up moving my mom into my home. Um, we remodeled the bottom floor of my home for her. And she was able to spend her last months with us. And I was able to care for her. So it was nice, too, I think, being in the salon because unlike corporate America, not not every entity is this way, right, in corporate America, but it's pretty um, emotionless. There's not a lot of feeling, emotion in that workforce demographic, but the salon is a completely different animal, I have come to find out. <laughs> and that was really nice. I think the universe knew that at that moment in my life, I really needed that. And uh, I came in as the corporate controller and we, we tripled revenue, um, I would say by year two that I was there. and it's just been a wild ride. You know, I'm so used to uh, my professional world being very black and white. And I came into the salon world and learned very quickly that it is 50 shades of gray. So lots of learning for me, but it's, it's yeah. been really, really great. I've learned a lot and um, I'm thankful to be where I am. Oh, wow. I'm so sorry about your mom. And I'm, I'm yeah, grateful thank you. that you had the ability to be with her in that, in that intimate setting for um, right. that time frame. I'm curious because people listening will ask, what does it mean to be a corporate controller? Well, it's, uh, it's really the way it sounds, right? I control almost every decision that's made across the organization. So um, if there's a price increase that comes across my desk, if we switch a vendor, it comes across my desk. If we need to renegotiate a lease or a contract, it comes across my desk. If we are going to hire or terminate like a marketing firm that comes across my desk. And, you know, there's a point in my, in my position, I'm kind of like backing out a little bit now of the operational piece, but there was a point um, in time when I had to really like get in the trenches with my team. You know, I would sweep hair, I would clean color bowls, scrub toilets, you name it. I was really in there with the team because I had to understand what every dollar was tied to and what the, the guest experience really was um, because I'd only been in the chair. I'd never really been behind it. So I think in order to be a leader, you've got to be a servant one. Mm. So that's how I started out. Well, and to say we tripled revenue by a year two, I mean, that's, it's so humble, but it's huge to sure. triple multi local. Tell us how many locations you have and a bit about MDG salons. Yeah. So we're two locations. Um, we are in two pretty affluent neighborhoods. We're in the heart of Indianapolis. Um, and then we are in Carmel, Indiana, which if you, if you Google Carmel, it's, one of the places to raise a family and um, our clientele, the demographic certainly speaks to that. Um, but yeah, the, the two locations are fantastic. Um, Tell the me more teams, about the size, right? You have a huge, yeah. huge locations and huge teams. So the teams are really interesting. Um, Travis also three years ago, Travis is my husband and an owner. He said, we need a barbering brand because these men's haircuts were kind of like clogging up the brand a little bit. So, uh, or the salon floors. So we, we developed a barbering brand. It's really taken off. So we've got barbers and stylists that any given time, we're about 50 deep uh, with stylists and, and that ebbs and flows, right? So we're a hybrid salon. We do have some booth renters or independent contractors there. Um, we're not actively searching for that demographic um, on our salon floor. However, the people we have are amazing, um, but we're growing. We've got assistants, stylists, barbers. Um, we're, we're a pretty sizable organization for sure. That's so incredible. And congrats on starting the barbering brand. That's so Thank hot. you. We yeah. love it. Yeah. Very cool. So you're thriving. You've tripled revenue since you've been there three years mm -hmm. in, you're doing awesome. And then COVID, what were you thinking? <laughs> 
when you started. I mean, the talk is survive and thrive. Okay. So, uh, so we got to right. survive this thing. And all of, what were yeah. you thinking when you first started just hearing in the background, like, ah, oh, COVID virus. Okay. So funny story. Goose is here. It's my dog, by the way. Um, funny story. So Travis and I actually were in Rome uh, for a business trip. We were courting a, um, uh, I guess you could say like a vendor, if you will, a distributor, manufacturer, all of those things um, uh, regarding a treatment line. And so we were over in Rome and we got there mid to late February and no kidding, we were there 48 hours and we got a call early, like the morning after our first night there. And they said, hey, we're going to evacuate you <laughs> so you don't get stuck here. And we had known that coronavirus was a thing but it hadn't really yet really made its impact on the U S and um, you know, we have two children. So we were like, uh, yeah, get us out of here. So we don't get stuck away from our babies. And we came back. And at that moment I said to him, you know, this is coming here and we need to start planning. Um, and when 2020 began, our word for the year was content. <laughs> And then suddenly it was COVID and social distancing uh -huh. and PPE and all the things. So we did start out uh, pretty heavy handed early on. Um, we voluntarily closed our shops on March 16th. That was before any government body had ordered the same. And we felt really good about that. Our teams were very grateful and um, supportive of our decisions. And I think it spoke to the level of buy-in that we have with our teams. They just really trust the decision making um, that we as a brand have exhibited in the past and, and also currently. Well, and you shared an interesting perspective because you have a larger team, you have different demographics within your team. Tell us about that we dynamic do. and how that impacted your decision. Yeah. So we've got, um, we've got babies and then we have people who are over the age of 65. Um, our team ranged from 18 years of age to, I believe it's like 71 or 72. And we really had to pay attention to that, you know, because we want to always create equal opportunity for everyone on our salon floor. Um, and you know, that younger demographic, while they're pretty aware, super intelligent, they still like to move around and be social. And we really fear that they might carry something in to our salon that could potentially compromise um, the health and safety of, you know, that older demographic. And we just, our core values are honesty, integrity, and experience. And at the end of the day, if we were being honest with ourselves, it was not a good decision to keep our doors open. We really needed to shut down. And, you know, we thought that was going to be two to four weeks max. And, you know, 12 weeks later, <laughs> we, we've reopened our doors. So 12 weeks later, tell us about yeah. what happened in those 12 weeks for you personally and professionally. What did, what were the emotions you personally went through? What are the, some of the things you did to ensure the salon reopened uh, yeah. in a good state? Yeah. Uh, well, I'm a corporate controller and uh, that's my title, but it's also my nature to be able to control things. Uh, mm -hmm. That's, that's no probably shock to you. You've met me. <laughs> so you probably could pick up on that. I am pretty assertive and like to have control of situations. This was one time when I really had to just sit down and surrender. And um, that is not easy for me as an individual. And I think I felt guilty a little bit because I had to put this face on, you know, game face. We've all heard it. We've all said it. Um, we've heard the phrase fake it to make it. And I felt really guilty and at a point like unauthentic with our team because I had to be their cheerleader. You know, Travis had to be their cheerleader. We had recently hired a director of operations who was new to our brand and she had to be a cheerleader. And none of us knew because none of us had been through this before what was coming. So I leaned into the one thing I can always trust and that's analytics and uh, fact-based data, right? And I pulled, I pulled KPIs, I pulled, um, you know, P&Ls. I, I really looked at an overall analysis of our particular market and I said, okay, let's say that only half of these people return. And I think that that was being generous. 
you know, what does that mean? What does that look like for us? Um, what's our response to that? And, you know, we wrote, to get into the professional side, we wrote more business plans and strategies for reopening than I can count on two hands. And the personal and the professional really started to meld or bleed into the other because our government um, here in Indiana, they weren't quick to make a lot of decisions. They were, they were really made or announced in the 11th hour and we would get really hyped up and in love with the strategy and then bam, you know, that information was delivered in the 11th hour and then we would have to you know, rework. So it became discouraging at a point, but at the end of the day, what we know as owners and operators and, and even managers um, is that we have to put our game face on and we have to be really strong and present and positive for our teams. You know, I went through the same things. Candy Shaw mentioned it um, not too long ago, but I went through the very same feelings and hearing someone like Candy speak to what she went through personally really resonated with me. And it made me feel like I wasn't the only one who felt like I might be losing my mind, <laughs> but I felt the fear. I felt the, the want and desire to like hit the road and get as far away from the salon as I possibly could. But then when we stopped and we talked about each individual person on our team, and yes, there are a lot, but we absolutely did. We said every person's name and how we would be able to cater to them and, and what type of support we felt that they needed. I was ready to fight. And, and that's exactly what we did. Um, we really, we got down to it. Um, we pulled in our brand educators um, from some of our distributors and we said, hey, here's what we need to do. And we, we condensed service times. We took away blow dries. We, we just maximized the opportunities that we knew were going to be standing there at the front door on day one of reopening. And we spelled that out to our team. We educated them and provided them all the tools and resources necessary that they would need to be successful in that reopening. And by the grace of God, I'm telling you, uh, it worked because it was guesswork on everyone. Um, none of us had a playbook for this and I'm just really, I feel really fortunate, really blessed and just above all thankful that our team and not everybody on the team believed in it, right? You know, some people, they left and that's, that's the ugly truth of this. It's not for everyone. And I also know that those who stayed and those who remain, they had record breaking I mean, revenues out of their entire careers. We've had people doing hair for 15 and 20 years and they've never seen revenue like that. And they've come to us and they said, this was a direct result of you telling us what we were capable of, reminding us what we could do and then just making us do it. And they did it beautifully. And we're so proud to have a team like that. Again, we've got the buy-in. They, they trust us and we're really lucky. We know that. Wow, that's incredible, Laura. To do your job and to control things well, what are some of the tools that you need to run your your brands? Um, what couldn't you live without to make to help you with your job to make sure you're doing what you need to do for the salon? Mentors, a hundred percent mentors. Um, I lean on everyone who will give me an audience. You know, Katie, not to to be here because I have an audience with you or anything, but. But when I first started out, I listened to your podcast to become more familiar with what was going on in the industry and identify mentors and just lean into people. Um, look, I'm a fan of going to a party, finding the, par the smartest person in the room and standing next to that person and just really being a sponge and absorbing that. I think that, you know, I'm only 35, I'm about to be 36, but at, at my age, I don't know everything. And if if in this industry you don't believe that there's wisdom and counsel, I really think that you could fail pretty easily. Um, I listen to people like Candy Shaw, yourself, Jay Williams. Um, you know, I'm linked up with Cunity. We're calling on other salons in Texas, New York, PA, Florida. You know, Coral Please, um, Cole's Salon. We're we're touching base with them. I think that I could not live without mentors because those are people who have traveled the path before they've lived it and they know what probably is not going to work. And I think as long as, as we remain coachable, we'll find from, you know, success from that. So as far as I'm concerned, hundred percent mentors. 
Oh, I love your answer. And I'm right there with you. I mean, yeah. Yeah. And, and I thought it was interesting that when you first, t- you were talking about, I first learned the industry, I needed to know what every dollar was tied to. How has that changed by adding the capital into some of the new sanitation and safety measures for your salon? Yeah, it's, uh, it's been interesting. You know, we have to rewrite the model, the financial model. Um, we did that and it certainly looks a lot different than it did before. We've had to make some financial adjustments. Um, and, you know, we were $15,000 just to open the doors and that's just with PPE and cleaning implements. Um, not to mention we have a sanitation crew coming weekly. So they actually like disinfect the salons, which is fantastic. Um, but, you know, we've had to pass it on. Um, we've been fortunate enough to collaborate with some of our neighboring salons. And we've talked some of those salons out of passing that on to the actual stylist and kind of pivoting and shifting that to the guest, which is has always been our model uh, from day one of this quarantine or shutdown. So we do have an environmental fee. Uh, we did we did issue a price increase and we delivered that as like, hey, congratulations, like you've earned this. And by the way, we know that you had to sit at home for 12 weeks uh, without an earning opportunity. Let's go get it, you know, to reinvigorate the team, to get them excited. Um, they get a raise right out of the gate. So those are some things that we did that we thought would be helpful as we absorb those costs. I think an environmental fee, I've never heard anybody position it that way. So well done on the, on the copy for that. And I'm curious. That was Travis. <laughs> Good job, Travis. I like that environmental fee. What yeah. um, does, is that look different depending on the type of services or kind of a flat rate across the board? It's a per ticket. We just, it's $5 per ticket. Um, you know, that more than takes care of any mask. Uh, we have a laundry service. So where we were shifting in and out laundry on a daily basis, now it, sometimes it's twice a day, which is very costly. And again, that disinfectant crew that comes in, um, very costly. Yeah. No, it's, it's good to hear. I, I, I applaud that. Were there any things that you did while you were shut down that helped with earning income at all? Or did you kind of pause and maybe look more into the government funding opportunities or both? Yeah, I mean, we certainly were aware of what funding opportunities exist. Um, I am not a fan of, and this is, I'm not saying it's right, wrong, or indifferent. I don't want to pay for money if I don't have to. Um, We've been very fortunate over the last 36 years to make a lot of really strong financial moves and decisions. I'm very thankful for that. Um, You know, our two locations are separate entities, so we did treat each of them differently with respect to that government funding. Um, But, you know, we kept our director of operations and also one of our GMs on staff during the entire time to field those calls make those appointments, which we kept shifting back, um, just to reassure guests. So I feel like there's value there while it didn't exactly generate revenue in that moment. I think it led to it later on in time. Um, we did of course do some actually like deliverance, uh, if you will, or delivery of retail. So we're an Orbe exclusive salon and, um, while Orbe gave us this wonderful code to credit the salon, which is super kind of them to share in that with us, we also felt like it was really good for our guests to see the face of the owners. And so I would take all these orders with our team and Travis would actually deliver them. And I think that was really great. It's just value added in all the right places during that time of uncertainty for our guests. Well, you've definitely gotten through, hopefully, the the thick of it, and nobody can predict if there'll be another shutdown or not, but let's assume right. that we've we've gotten through, let's say, the worst of things. Um, yeah. Do you feel like you're in thrive mode yet, or are you still kind of in the survival mode of figuring things out? What's it been like as you've reopened? Well, in the spirit of being transparent, I think we're in survival mode. Uh, I think most salons are experiencing that. I think if if we say otherwise, we maybe aren't being true to ourselves. Um, Consumer behavior has changed. That's a fact. And while yes, we are seeing some guests 
who are new. Uh, those guests who we were used to coming in on an every four to six week basis, we're not seeing all of those. And a lot of them I've spoken to because again, we're always chasing that revenue. But I've personally had some conversations with those individuals and they're scared, they're nervous. You know, we're seeing a surge across the US right now. And that's, that's scary. You know, we have a lot of those gray coverage clients um, or new, or, yeah, new growth uh, coverage clients. And they're just nervous. And a lot of that has to do with the demographic, the age there. And you know, we're just trying to figure out how best to combat that. Again, this is, this is not a field any of us have played before. So we're trying to learn. And, and again, I'm leaning into that wisdom and counsel and identifying what, what other states are doing to find success in that. Well, well done and everything you have done. And the, the locations are beautiful and thank I, you. Yeah. I mean, congratulations on everything. I, I, I imagine that you had goals for 2020. Uh, yes. Everything looks <laughs> different now. Are it you, does. are you pushing those same goals into 2021 or do you have a different vision for what the next six to 12 months would look like for your salons? Yes, I, we're, we're most definitely pushing some goals back. Um, I think right now we're just bringing our teams in and we're really encouraging them to just perform in the moment, do your very best, you know, let's get through this and let's see what fall and winter bring because we don't know what, what I know we're doing is we're performing um, time-wise at a rate to prepare for another shutdown. You know, we are preparing for another, I'm going to call it a two week shutdown. I hope to God that doesn't happen, but it may. And if it does, we will financially be prepared for the same. Um, you know, we were ready for a remodel at our downtown location. We were really hyped up about that. Um, had all the design and all the things picked out, really excited, was negotiating the, the terms of that lease with our landlord actually just days before uh, COVID, our barber shop, we were getting ready to sign a letter of intent on a third location, uh, a standalone for that. And, you know, I think it depends on whatever, like higher power energy you believe in, the universe, God, or, or whatever. Um, but I, I think like God for us just called it at the right time. You know, he was like, hey, prepare your hearts. Um, what's coming is not going to be easy, but you know, maybe those things just weren't in front of us at the right time, you know, maybe six months from now is the right time. And I just am trying to, again, like I said earlier, surrender and trust that. And I know that, again, I know that we've got some really big goals and I'm super excited about them, uh, but they'll all come in the right time. And I just have to trust that that's, you know, six to six to maybe even 12 months from now. Well, I appreciate your faith, Laura, and <laughs> I think all things will work out uh, for the good. I'm curious, kind of as we near the end of our conversation, for salon owners listening who just need to feel a sense of encouragement right now, what is helping you every single day stay positive and also like uh, impart that with your team? And what would your words of wisdom be for them? So forgive me because this may be a little wordy and verbose. Um, it, it's, it hasn't been, it hasn't been easy. Our reopening, you know, we, we lost some team members that I really wish we wouldn't have. Okay. And, and we try to operate a business with as little emotion as possible, but at the end of the day, those things, they sting, right? They hurt. Um, but what I know is that we have the buy-in and the trust of so many other people on our team. And what I know is that we've come this far and we got here because of the blood, the sweat and the tears we were willing to just pour from the depths of our souls, if you will, because we had a dream and that's not going to stop. Um, I think as devastating globally as COVID was, as this pan pandemic continues to be, I think we have to stop and remember that it's allowed us as business owners to press the pause button that we're constantly searching for. We're always like, if I just had a minute, then I could do that. If I just had a minute, then maybe this would happen. You know, we just got that. And I think if anything, it should have offered us a clearer vision of how we want to 
run our brands. And I know for us, we really up the ante um, with respect to how how we're moving forward. You know, the caliber at which our team is performing is incredible. We're so proud of them. They've done so much with that time as well. But, um, you know, they always say every storm runs out of rain. This one will too, for sure. I love it. Every storm runs out of rain. And I yep. just truly appreciate your complete authenticity and transparency in today's conversation, Laura. It's been awesome having you here. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. I am so happy to have had the opportunity. Well, I don't want to make it the last time. No, I would love to love to sit and talk about the remodel and all the great things we're doing I in know. six to 12 months. <laughs> we'll get into the thrive mode eventually. Yeah. We'll, we'll reconvene, definitely. But I would love that. Again. Yes, thank you again. And thank you all for joining here week after week. Your loyal listenership is everything to us. If you love today's conversation, would you take a moment and leave us a positive review so that more people like yourself will discover Beyond the Technique, where we know we are changing the way salon owners are supported in their business. As always, in addition to surviving and thriving, I want you to have an awesome day and stay strong.